So uh, as we're finishing this series again, and this is very much related to what we've been talking about, please, on your way to enjoy the pancakes, or if you already did, if you would make your way to the Connect Center and adopt a child or family for Christmas. This is so personal to me, and I know I've shared my story before, but uh, back when I was a teenager and we were in a, my family was in a rough spot, we were on public assistance, and a church, we weren't connected to a church, but a church found out how bad it was for us, and they adopted us. And they gave us turkey at Thanksgiving. I, Christmas presents that year were labeled to teenage boy. But I never forgot it. It, it meant the world to me, and it means the world to these families. Listen, it's like we're at church, and you know, we just got new carpet, which I'm convinced has some sort of 3D puzzle in it. And we live in this area of so much affluence. Please help out these families. It, it really does mean the world to them. So on your way to the Pancakes, visit the Connect Center where you can do that uh, over the next couple of Sundays. All right, so this is it. This is our final installment. If you're brand new today, welcome. This will make sense, hopefully. But you can always go back and listen. We went chapter by chapter through the book of Ephesians. And I hope that for those who've been here for most of the six weeks, it feels like you really learned a book of the Bible. You feel pretty confident in understanding it. So I think that's really important and helpful. All right, so where we last left off was this important piece, and that is God doesn't want us to run from darkness, but bring light to the darkness. In other words, God doesn't call Christians to just, okay, now listen, and I know some of you were actually raised this way. Listen, the world is evil. You got to be in your own little Christian cocoon, Christian bubble, and protect yourselves against that evil world. Which, yeah, the world is evil. However, the Bible I'm reading says we're supposed to carry the light of God into the darkness. Think about extreme examples of hiding from the darkness would be like the Amish community. Like we're just going to separate ourselves from this evil world. But I don't believe that that's what God's calling us to do. It's certainly not what Paul is saying in the book of Ephesians. He's saying, in this dark world, we, are, we have been called. We are God's plan for the world to bring light to it. One of the things I've been asked a lot over the last month is about the end times. Get lots of questions. It's on your minds, especially with everything happening in the Middle East. Is this it? Pastor, is this end time stuff? I want to say just a quick word on that is, yes, I think we're closer to the end than we were yesterday. <laughs> however, however, and these certainly, all the signs that we're seeing in the world is all stuff in the Bible. We're talking about earthquakes and we're talking about wars, we're talking about famines, we're talking about sickness, but yes, yes and yes, yes, it's playing out. Here's the challenge, though. Uh, there are some very famous end times preachers, and e when I turn the TV, they're always on. And they have a big end times map behind them, or something like that. And they're trying to tell you about how this is exactly this in Revelation, and this is this. And so everybody, hang on. It's all happening. You're about to get the mark of the beast and like all that other stuff. I think they mean well. Here's the problem. I've rarely ever seen that message turn into faithfulness. I've always seen it turn into fear and anxiety. Those are not things the Lord wants to produce in you. Jesus himself said, nobody knows the day or the hour. So live every day like it's your last. Make the most of this day. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. All that other stuff, honestly, Jewish apocalyptic apocalyptic literature is the genre of the book of Revelation, which is all meant to be a secret code to believers to say, hang on, have comfort, God's going to win against this evil Roman empire. That's what all that imagery was, but it's like, so-and-so is the Antichrist? I don't think so, but the way it's all playing out, it's meant to give us hope, meant to give us courage, meant to give us faith. They look, God's got this. Spoiler alert, God wins. But I will say this, it feels like over the last year especially, and I know some of you, you've felt this, 
it almost like, I try to explain to people, it feels electric with the spiritual world right now. People are coming back to church, coming back to God. I think because they discovered that during the pandemic and all the craziness of that, the things that they put their trust in didn't work. Maybe there's something more. But I'm hearing stories of like life change. People coming back to God and and like they are transformed. Or people who've been with God their whole lives feeling like I need to go deeper, man. I need to stop messing around and figure this out. Everything feels heightened right now. And I will say this, yes, spiritual attack happens, but it's not always the devil. All right, any Waterboy fans? Wow, that, was, that hit like a lead balloon, all right. Here's what I mean. We're going to talk about spiritual warfare because chapter 6 of Ephesians is talking about spiritual warfare. It's real. It's real. We're going to talk about that. But I also want to say this. I don't think every time I trip, it's because the devil stuck his leg out. Right? I don't want to give him that much credit, to be honest. I'm perfectly capable of sinning all by myself. But are we facing the darkness and like active spiritual realities around us? We are. And we don't like to think about it because it freaks us out. I have like a line that I draw with scary movies. Some of you are like, "Mm mm-hmm, I know, I'm with you right away. And it's like, if it's like spiritual scary, I'm like, yeah, I don't need that. I don't need that living in my head rent free. Yeah, so... It can, be, it can be scary, but the whole point of what Paul's about to say is to give us courage. You don't have to be scared. God's got you. But you can't ignore your, the spiritual reality because then you're more likely to just become a victim of it. God doesn't want victims. He wants people actively charging out into the dark world with the light of Christ. He wants to be ready for it. So every bad thing in your life doesn't mean the devil's sticking his leg out. On the other hand, there is obviously a spiritual reality. I probably, I don't have to convince you of that. You've felt it. Have you ever been around people or a place and you feel the heaviness of darkness? Yes. Have you been around people or a place where you feel a lightness, a hope, a love? Yes. There's a spiritual reality. If we think we're actually eternal beings, obviously there's a supernatural reality going on. You know what it is? It's basically field of dreams, okay? Let's just make it easy. No, seriously though, the supernatural reality of our lives, I I love field of dreams. So some of you weren't even born in 1989. For those of us who remember this film well, we're probably old enough to keep getting those AARP invites, which I am offended at every time. How dare you? Not that old. But the whole idea of you're hearing a voice and it's calling you to do something that is definitely not from inside of you. It's something else. It's like calling you to do something you weren't going to do, but you feel compelled to like, you know what? I feel like God's telling me I got to do this thing. And in the film, what I love is, is that just answering it once didn't lead to the conclusion. It was a series of many steps, which is very true. It's, It's how I've experienced God. I've never heard an audible voice. But I've definitely felt a voice, perceived a voice, saying, do this, do this, go there, do that. It's like when you have, um, you ever have that thing where you think about somebody out of the blue that you haven't thought of in a long time? Like, I should should see how they're doing. You shoot them a text, you give them a call, and it's clear you were supposed to. They needed to hear from you. They wanted to talk. It's wild. There's no way that's coincidence. That's a spiritual reality and so when we listen to god we are obeying i mean and it gets sort of wild too all sorts of things happen we we have dreams i love that scene where they have the same dream of uh, the fictional writer terrence mann right i'm supposed to take terrence mann in a game at fenway oh yeah where you're sitting this far up eating a hot dog i had the same dream they knew there was something supernatural going on this happens all around us And I'll just share with you, this is a a personal story. I think I've shared it before, but not often, because I don't want people to think I'm crazy. And that's the thing with supernatural stuff, right? You don't want people to think you're crazy. All right, let's just agree 
We're not all going to think we're crazy, at least over this matter. All right. So it wasn't just coming to Christ at 19 in a summer camp that led me into ministry. I had a dream that was my, I felt like was my calling into ministry. And I just felt it. It was unlike any other dream I had. And when I woke up, I knew it was God talking to me. It was the weirdest thing. Here, here's the dream. So I'm at the camp. I'm a Christian for one week. And I'm at the camp, a bunch of fourth graders. Which, I don't know, maybe I was a little sleep deprived. I'm not sure. But I'm at, I'm at this camp, and I go to sleep. I had this dream. And the dream was extremely vivid. I can remember it even now as I talk about it. Is all the kids at camp, and some of the adults were at camp, all had injuries. Some were on crutches, some head were banded, some were bleeding, some were laying down on the ground because they couldn't get up. Everybody was injured. And I remember running around looking for help. We got to help these kids. What the heck happened? What's going on? And nobody would answer me. And then finally, someone, someone's like, I'm like, can you see what's going on with these kids? And they're like, what are you talking about? We don't see anything. And I woke up from that dream, and here's what I felt, and I felt it stronger than anything I ever felt in my life. God was telling me, you're going to be somebody who goes out and helps tend to the wounds that nobody sees. Because everybody's wounded. And I felt like I'm supposed to do ministry. That was my call to ministry. And I can't explain it. I don't know what it was, but I knew that it was God saying, if you build it, he will come. Like, you got to go do this thing. There are two uh, congregation members, and I got permission to share their stories, uh, although I'm, they're going to remain anonymous. Uh, the first was uh, in a Bible study with us, men's study, just this last week, or two weeks ago, and was sharing about how he had this estranged family member that he once was close with. And was saddened that they hadn't spoken in a long time and they had a falling out. And, that, and, you know, we all prayed for it that night. And the very next Bible study, he came back. He's like, you're never going to believe what happened. She came into town to New York City, gave me a call. And we hung out and had lunch, and it was awesome. We reconnected. The spiritual reality of prayer, of what God's doing all around us, there is no way... There's way too many coincidences that start piling up to just explain it away. Another thing happened this summer. Family came to me and uh, said, Pastor, I don't want you to think we're crazy. I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> and said, we, we believe there's a spiritual presence of some kind in our house. And my immediate thought was, you don't come to Presbyterians for this stuff. <laughs> like, go, go find the Pentecostals, man. They'll take care of you. They know what they're doing. Or go find the Catholics. They got like ways of dealing with that. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. So, but it's, it's right there. but um, there were, all I can say is, there, is, there was a verifiable spiritual entity in their house. I'm sorry to say, it's real. So I made some calls, put a team together, went to go to the house to pray. It was actually really an incredible experience. The, the whole experience, incredible. Um, wild. But it definitely made me think, you know, we don't think about this stuff a lot. Why do you think that's the case? Maybe just because it's scary, or maybe we feel like it's too much out of our control. Here's another thing that I've noticed about myself, and maybe you can relate. I'm way too easily distracted by stuff. And I feel like the distraction just becomes a little bit of a crutch from dealing with the deep stuff. So, we don't like to think about it. But why should we? Paul believed that if we don't think about it, we can't live out our purpose that God wants us to live. Because we need to be prepared. Don't need to be scared, but need to be prepared. That there's a spiritual reality to this ministry of ours. And in uh, this chapter 6, this Greek word dunamis, which means the power of God that flows through the believer. 
This is what Paul believed, that the power of God flows through us, enables us to do things we couldn't otherwise do. This is where the supernatural reality of God comes out of us, the reality of our lives. It's used 117 times in the New Testament, and it's used all over chapter 6 of Ephesians. The power of God flowing through us to do things we couldn't otherwise do. Okay, so it's exactly like the force. All right, maybe not exactly. Let it flow through you, right? All right? We are equipped with God's power to handle whatever spiritual reality is around us. There are some examples of this. Two examples, just real quick. Mark chapter 5. Uh, there's a woman who'd been bleeding for years, and she finds Jesus in a crowd, reaches out to touch his cloak, and Jesus feels power, dunamis, leave from his body. Once he realized the power had gone out from him, he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? That's an example. Another one, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. To all of us, you will receive power, dunamis, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. That we, just by virtue of being God's children, we have been equipped with this power that comes from God himself to live this life, to bring the light out into the darkness. All right, with all of that, here we go with chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty powers, mighty dunamis. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And in the uh, Anchor Bible series, which is a, a commentary resource in Ephesians, it talks about uh, the, the full armor of God meant the full equipment of a soldier with weapons of offense and defense. Thinking about like Roman soldier garb. That there's a spiritual armor we're to put on. And notice it says, put on. So you can be a Christian, you could be a believer and not put on the armor of God. And I think that happens a lot because people feel like, well, you know, I'm going to sit this one out. We're going to let the real spiritual people fight it out and, you know, I'm not, I'm not one of those and, or whatever our, you know, wherever our mind is, we feel like we're not adequate. And you're right, we're not, not one of us is. That's the whole point is that uh, Jesus fills us and makes us adequate to go out into the world, to make those connections, to bring the light into the darkness, all of that. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Again, this uh, commentary says it this way that I really like. It says, the saints, that's you, are able-bodied men and women not by nature, nor by one act of ordination in the past, but only in as much as again and again they take up the special armor given to them. You have all been equipped. You have been given everything you need to bring light into the darkness in the world. And this is meant to be a great comfort. This is meant to be a comfort. Listen, yes, there's evil in the world. There's darkness in the world. But guess what? You do not have to be afraid. You don't have to be scared. Just be prepared. It's going to happen. Just trust. He's got you. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. So then he gets into the armor. And this, when I was younger, I thought was really cool. So I don't know. Maybe your kids would think this is cool. But I felt like it was a real easy way of remembering what God's telling me to do. So imagine armor, Roman soldier armor, and here's what he says. He says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. And actually, buckled is a bad English translation in a way. Uh, the word in the Greek is more like girded, like uh, girding a belt around you, gird your loins, prepare for battle. The idea is if you're wearing a robe and you put on the belt, you're prepared for activity. If you take it off, you're prepared for rest. So what's he saying? He's like, be prepared for spiritual activity as you go out into your life with God's truth making you prepared. He continues, with the breastplate of righteousness. What's a, a breastplate do? It guards your heart, guards your lungs. And so how do you guard your heart when it comes to God? Well, you know, it's guarded and protected by what Jesus did on the cross. Christ's righteousness is given to you 
Do not let your hearts be troubled. You know that God's got you. Guard your heart, because a lot of things are going to be pulling for your heart. And know that God's righteousness is protecting you, no matter what. He's not going to just decide to, well, all right, um, you didn't quite make the grade this year. He's not Santa. Don't get cold in a year, right? It's not about your behavior. He's got you, no matter what. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. That's, put your shoes on, man. Get ready to go. You're not sitting this one out. Right? Shoes on, you're ready. Shoes off, you're resting. What's he getting at? He's saying, like, time is short. Make the most of every opportunity. If you believe that what God did for you on the cross matters, live like it matters. Right now, not someday. Someday when maybe you're less busy. Someday when maybe you're a little bit older. Someday, someday, someday. No, your someday is right now. Live it now. The readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. That the gospel of Jesus should make us ready to go. Ready to say yes. I'm heading out there. All right, he continues. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. I love that. The reason? There are lots of arrows, man. And the cool thing about faith, and this is what I always envisioned, is that the more you grow in your relationship with God, the more faith you have, the bigger the shield gets. You can handle a lot more coming at you in your life if your faith is growing and vibrant and active. And then finally, take the helmet of salvation. What's the helmet do? Guard your mind, guard your brain. We talk about the renewing of your mind, right? It guards your mind, your identity in Christ, which is where we started in Ephesians. Remember who you are. Guard that. Because everyone's going to tell you you're not that. What do you mean you're a Christian? I parted with you way too much to believe that. What do you mean you're going to go do this thing and volunteer somewhere? We're going to go to the game. I'm giving you a ticket. What do you mean? It's all pulling at your identity. Not that any of that stuff is bad. It's just everything's trying to distract us from what matters most. Everything. And then finally, in the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Interesting that this is the only offensive weapon in the armor of God because God's Word is all we need. Here's what that doesn't mean. Some of you have been on the other end of God's word in a very negative way, where people decided not to use it as a sword that's precise, but as a a blunt instrument to knock you over the head with. That's not what he's talking about. I don't believe that sort of people, you know what happens, people play Bible darts, they get really selective, so they'll cherry pick one verse out and be like, you're not doing this, or you should stop doing that. That's not what he means. He means if you're going to fight the battle of good and evil in your life, you have to know and connect with and live God's word. That's the sword of his truth. Because what happens is you get all the lies. How do you you get through the lies? You know what the truth is? By God's word. That's your weapon. Nothing will prosper against that weapon. (laughs) Evil's not going to win. If you don't know the Bible, just take some baby steps to get to know it. Use that Advent devotional. That's a great way just to get started. Use the YouVersion Bible app. It's free. Thousands of Bible studies on there that show up automatically on your phone. And the whole point of this is everything is about prayer. Prayer works. Prayer does something. Oh, I haven't seen this family member in years. We pray. Connection. Prayer does something. He says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind be alert and always keep on praying for all the lord's people you know what he's doing he's doing what we talk about here he's telling the ephesians he's giving them the halftime speech that church isn't the game life out there is the game this is the halftime speech go win you have everything you need now go out there and do it this is what he's telling them You have everything you need in Jesus Christ. Go out there and win. Go out there and do it. Stop messing around. 
You only got one more half to play. Prayer is not a passive or occasional practice. It's an active, dynamic, constant lifeline of God's power. And then finally, he closes the book of Ephesians, the letter, with some personal stuff, which I love. Just reminds us he's trying to live it out. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in change. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. In other words, sometimes I'm not fearless. Pray that I will be. Woo! What if we all started praying that? Pray that I would be fearless. And then it's like, he sort of a little shout out to Tychicus. I don't know who that is. Apparently he was a colleague. He made, he made the letter. It's pretty cool for him. The dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord will tell you everything so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. He's trying to live it out. He's living it in community with other people. This is, this is the answer. This is the secret sauce to your life. This is it. Believe it and put it into action. We could have saved a lot of time, I know. I could just could have told you that. Believe it and do it because the day is short. Yes, we're a lot closer to the end than we were before. Yes, there's a spiritual reality out there, but you've been given everything you need. Now go out and win. All right, so let's close the whole thing up. Here we go. From the top, real fast. This is how all of Ephesians here in about 30 seconds. When Jesus went to the cross and died for us, that love had the power to change everything about who we are. And God had a plan from before the earth was formed. Jesus was unmasked by what he did on the cross. It was God the whole time, making a way where there was no way. And that this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling, worthy of what Jesus did on the cross, and that this life should shine like diamonds against the black felt. It should shine with brilliance, the Christian life, so that people see the light in you and want to know where that light comes from. And to live Paul's imperative, you believe it, you need to do it. So now put on the full armor of God and go out there and win. Why? Be very careful how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Remember who you are. You are an adopted child of God. When you remember who you are, your purpose becomes clear. And may all of us, may our prayer be the same as Paul's prayer. Pray that for all of us, that whenever we speak, words may be given so that we may fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, this is the power of love for you. Amen.